Welcome to Hear the Word of God, the online and broadcast teaching ministry of the Rev. Eric Alexander. New section of Isaiah to which we turn this evening. Let me just remind you in a moment of the previous sections of Isaiah that we have looked at because there is a real sense in which Isaiah does fall into sections that you can fairly clearly identify. The first twelve chapters, for example, provide us with a picture of Isaiah the prophet addressing the people of God largely within the boundaries of their own nation, what we call today the Holy Land. And he is generally speaking into the present time, although occasionally, as is true all through Isaiah, you find him weaving prophecy addressed to the present time with a vision of God's end time and of what God is going to do ultimately to solve the problems of the present time. So in the first twelve chapters you get these visions of the coming of the Messiah. A virgin shall be with child and bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel and so on. But generally speaking, This is Isaiah in chapters 1 to 12 addressing the present time and the people within the boundaries of Israel and Judah, mainly Judah. 13 to 23, these next uh, chapters, 11 chapters of Isaiah, provide us with a picture of Isaiah addressing the nations, not just Israel and Judah, but the whole of the ancient world, what we called in the map the Fertile Crescent, stretching in the south and west from the Nile right over through Assyria and down to the east in the river Euphrates. Now that whole stretch of land uh, encompasses almost the entire area where the dramas of the Old Testament are worked out. And it's an area called the Fertile Crescent for the very obvious reasons that it's a crescent in shape reaching from the Nile over to the Euphrates and that it is the fertile area surrounded by mountains at one side and sand on the other. So in chapters 13 to 23, uh, Isaiah is addressing all these nations, Babylon as well as Judah, uh, Moab and the Philistines. He is addressing the whole of the ancient uh, world. And here he tends to be speaking more into the future, uh, sometimes the immediate future and often the longer term future. Now the next section of Isaiah is the one we've just finished looking at, chapters 24 to 27, which are concerned not just with uh, Judah or with the whole of that ancient eastern world, but with the whole earth. If you look at chapter 24, for example, the the words, the earth, occur again and again and again. The Lord is going to lay waste the earth. Verse 3, the earth will be completely laid waste. Verse 4, the earth dries up. The earth is defiled by its peoples. And the vision is a much larger vision. It is now the vision of what God is going to do throughout the whole earth. And there is a pushing back of the frontiers of time as well in these chapters. And it's clear that Isaiah is addressing himself more to the end of all time. Now these are obviously generalizations, but they may help us to see a little more just what the pattern of the development of Isaiah's prophecy is. Now in chapters 28 to 33, we have a whole section where Isaiah is sent again to address his own people. 
in Judah. You will remember that it's the southern kingdom of Judah to which Isaiah is specifically sent by God. And in his own contemporary world, largely speaking, although you get, as you would even see in this evening's chapter, glimpses into the ultimate solution to the problems of the nations in him who is the chief cornerstone, that is Christ. But uh, it may well be that those are who say that here Isaiah is giving us examples of his sermons, of his preaching to his contemporaries, that they are right and that what we have here are a series of Isaiah's addresses or sermons to uh, his contemporary situation. Uh, you can almost catch the idea of what they are about if you note that particular, almost every one of them, particularly chapters 28, 29, uh, 30, uh, 31, and 33 begin with the same uh, word. They begin with the word woe. Verse 1 of chapter 28, Woe to that wreath, the pride of Ephraim's drunkards. Chapter one, uh, 29, verse 1, Woe to you, Ariel, Ariel. Chapter 30, Woe to the obstinate children. Chapter 31, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. Chapter 33, Woe to you, O destroyer. Now, it's important for us to grasp what it is that uh, Isaiah is saying and what lies behind this introduction to every one of these utterances. Because to us, a woe tends to be a noun in our usage, doesn't it? And we use it as a slightly trivial word. You know, we may say to somebody, if we've been unburdening ourselves to them, dear me, there am I giving you all my woes. And we usually mean the rather irksome things that trouble us, little irritations day by day. But that would be completely to miss the point of what this word means in Isaiah and indeed in Scripture generally. In the Old Testament especially, it is a pronouncement of the most serious kind. It is a word of warning. It is not so much a noun as an exclamation. And it's a warning about the coming of God's curse upon an individual or a nation or a situation. If you want to understand what it means, you need to see its opposite, and its opposite is the word blessed. Now, one of the places where you see the two put together is in the New Testament, in Luke's version of the Beatitudes. Do you remember that in Luke chapter 6, Luke has a version of the Beatitudes, for example, from verse 20 of Luke 6. He begins looking at his disciples. He said, Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who hunger now. Blessed are you who weep now. Blessed are you when men hate you, and so on. But then in Luke's version, that is followed from verse 24 by a series of woes. Woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now. Woe to you who laugh now. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. And you notice how these two things are put together. Blessed are you, woe to you. And as the blessed speaks of a benediction being pronounced upon someone, congratulated for the condition that they are in, the woe speaks of a malediction which is pronounced upon them, a warning about the solemn seriousness and danger of their condition. 
Now here is Isaiah sent by God then to pronounce a malediction upon the people of Judah. They are in a dangerous situation. Spiritually, they are on a disastrous course. And they don't, of course, always recognize it. But Isaiah comes as God's faithful servant. As we were reading this evening, they would not listen to him. But time and events and history and above all, God proved him to be right. And all that he spoke of became true. So there is this solemn note about these sermons of Isaiah which must have been so uncomfortable in so many ways to listen to. Now, in chapter 28, and verses 1 to 13 particularly, and I guess we'll only have time to look at uh, chapter 28 this evening, but in that chapter there is a solemn exposure, a dreadful exposure, of the kind of society in that existed especially in Israel, that's in the northern kingdom. You know it's called Ephraim. Wherever you read Ephraim, that's a description of the northern kingdom, the ten tribes. One of them was called Ephraim, but Ephraim stood for them all. And so when you read Ephraim in chapter 28 and verse 1, that is a description of Israel, the northern kingdom. And it's a warning, especially to Judah. You will notice uh, verse 14, for example, he quite specifically is now addressing the people in Judah, although most people think that he is using Ephraim as a warning for Judah. Look at them. You can imagine what he's saying. Look at them. See what has happened there. See this ghastly, disgraceful picture that has taken place in Ephraim, and be warned. So in 14 he says, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem. That's the capital of Judah. But the picture that he is describing is such a warning to Judah because it is a picture of national decay. And one of the signs of it, do you notice, is drunkenness. Woe to that wreath, that garland of flowers, the pride of Ephraim's drunkards. Now, there's some very vivid language that Isaiah is using here. If we put it into our own language, it would be the rather tawdry, worn-out party hats that appear the next morning after a riotous night. And they wear them, you know, proud of them. And they're tilted to one side, stained and torn and bedraggled, probably soaked into the bargain. And there they are, these pathetic figures, wearing their party hats as though it was something to be proud of. In the ancient world, they would have been faded floral garlands. And Isaiah says, woe to that wreath the pride of Ephraim's drunkards. He is speaking about drunkenness. You will know, of course, that what the Bible warns against is not so much, I am bound to say to you, not so much the whole question of partaking of alcohol, but the question of drunkenness. I think it would be impossible for us to show from Scripture that any form of consumption of alcohol is sinful. Now, I say this as somebody who is uh, a teetotaler. But I think in Scripture the warning is against drunkenness. That's what you find Scripture warning us against. And there is absolutely no question, whatever questions we may ask about other things, that drunkenness in Scripture is a sin. And the reason it is a sin is that it has an evidence of self-indulgence instead of self-discipline. And uh, Isaiah pours this awesome 
corn upon these people to the fading flower, his glorious beauty set on the head of a fertile valley to that city. This was probably Samaria, the pride of those laid low by wine. Now, the real tragedy of this self-indulgence is not just that it's seen in the nation, but that it has actually come to the spiritual heart of the nation, and that this disease of self-indulgence has infected the priesthood and the prophets and the men of God who were set apart to lead the nation. Now, look at the description from verse 7. These also stagger from wine. Now, this is a description of, of drunkenness, a very vivid one. Some of it so vivid that we might almost be surprised to find it in Scripture. It is disgustingly vivid. But notice it. They stagger from wine. They reel from beer. Priests and prophets stagger from beer and are befouled fuddled in their minds with wine. Why cannot the prophet think straight? Why is he not speaking clearly? The answer is, his mind is befuddled with wine. They stagger, verse 7, when seeing visions. They stumble when rendering decisions and the utterly debased level that it reaches in verse 8 is this. All the tables are covered with vomit, and there is not a spot without filth. Now, that's a graphic description of a society and its spiritual leaders which had gone down the pathway gradually. Of course, this hadn't happened all of a sudden. This wasn't just a one-night binge. This was a direction in which the nation and the priesthood and the prophets had been going gradually over a period of time until, you see, the point comes when the people despise them. you imagine going into the temple and finding the tables covered with vomit? And it's the priests and the prophets. And I say again to you, the evil of it, and I'm sure this is the real evil of uh, drunkenness, is that it is self-indulgence instead of self discipline. Now, verses 2 to 4 of the chapter tell us the Lord is going to judge that self-indulgence. You notice what he says, see, the Lord has one who is powerful and strong. Now, we know that that was the Assyrian army. And we know that God raised up the Assyrians as the instrument in his hands to chastise and discipline his own people. And you will see the whole point of this. Uh, what God is saying is that if these people will not discipline themselves, he will discipline them. That's the principle. So he says, see, the Lord has one who is powerful and strong. And then he begins to use the kind of language that is common in Isaiah from nature, from uh, fierce weather conditions to describe judgment like a hailstorm and a destructive wind, like driving rain and flooding downpour. He will throw it forcefully to the ground. That wreath. The pride of Ephraim's drunkards will be trampled underfoot. That fading flower, his glorious beauty, set on the head of a fertile valley, will be swallowed up like a ripe fig. And God is going to discipline a people who will not discipline themselves. Now, that is something which is a solemn note that we need to put into our own national situation. I suppose we have seldom known a people
period of history when in Western society we have been so self-indulgent as we are today and so undisciplined. And the warning of Isaiah is that if we will not discipline ourselves, God will discipline us. And we need to put that warning into the personal realm of our own personal life as well. Don't you think it's a real thing in, uh, in our own world? Now, interwoven with that warning, and it's a beautiful thing to see how Isaiah combines this solemn warning with words of such amazing grace. And he from verse 5 to verse 6, points out the ultimate and most glorious way in which God means to change people out of this self-indulgence into true beauty. In that day, verse 5, the Lord Almighty will be a glorious crown, a beautiful wreath. If you want garlands to make you beautiful, says Isaiah, God is the one who has them. He is the one who is able to create true beauty. People who, in this feverish sense, look for joy, you know, the party spirit. Isaiah says, God has a garland to give you. It's God who is the author and fountain of all true joy. And uh, that's so true, you know. I, I vividly remember, this is an intermezzo, I vividly remember when I was a student. Um, I think it's round about now, isn't it? Daft Friday? When's Daft Friday? Round about now. Well, it was Daft Friday, and uh, you know, in the University Union, there was a whole night long rave up. And in the morning, uh, they were all coming, pouring out of the Union. It happened that I was going up to the university for another purpose, but uh, I passed by the Union quite early in the morning. And there were two fellows I knew very well, nice chaps. They were coming staggering down the stairs, looking absolutely awful. I've never seen people look so ill. And one of them looked up and recognized me, and he said, Oh, Eric. It's a pity you didn't come to join our great night. <laughs> I looked at him and thought, my word, isn't it just? And there's something quite pathetic about a whole society that's feverishly looking for that, you know, when the Lord has a garland that he can give. And when there is a depth and quality and subtlety and glory in the beauty that he brings into life, that nothing in the whole world can compare with. Now from verse 9, you get an exposure of another aspect of this same spirit. And it's very significant. It is the cry, the cry that comes from the people of Judah and Israel. Don't treat us like children. We are grown adults. That's the phrase. Now, have you ever heard that coming out when people are wanting you not to stop them doing anything? You know, Don't treat us like children. We are grown adults. Listen to what they say. Who is he trying to teach? To whom is he explaining his message? You can almost catch the note of the slightly inebriated way in which they are speaking. To children weaned from their milk, to those just taken from the breast. For it is do and do, do and do, rule and rule, rule and rule, rule a little here, a little there. They are mimicking Isaiah, you see. Don't treat us like children. Isn't it rather interesting, incidentally, that the one time a man becomes like a little child is when he's drunk? Absolutely stupid. 
And they say, is he trying to te treat us like children? But there is a particular form of a non-teachable spirit here, you know. And an unwillingness for any kind of restraint. Nobody's very sure what the actual words of verse 10 mean. They rhyme a bit in the Hebrew, but it's difficult to tell exactly what they mean. Some think that they are complaining that Isaiah is giving them rules and regulations and constraining and restricting them. It would be difficult to be sure, but certainly they are complaining, you're teaching us like children, you're trying to treat us like children. We are grown adults. They say. And God's response is, well, if you won't learn this way, which would be so much easier, you will have to learn the hard way. And that will be this way, verse 11. Very well then, God says, with foreign lips, and strange tongues God will speak to this people, namely in Assyrians' language. That is, he is saying, the Assyrians are going to come, and they will be the foreign tongues who will be used to take you like disobedient children, and the word of the Lord to them, verse 13, will become do and do, do and do, rule and rule, rule and rule, a little here, a little there. So they will go and fall backward, be injured and snared and captured. Now, all the time, you see, isn't it interesting? The Lord wanted them to find rest. And notice what he says, verse 12. God will speak to this people to whom he said, this is the resting place. Let the weary rest here, and this is the place of repose. But they would not listen, and they would not have God's way of finding peace. Notice, they would not have God's way of finding joy. They would not have God's way of finding peace. And so they decided that they would find their peace and security by human means. Now notice how they do it. Um, verse 14. Therefore hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem. You boast. We have entered into a covenant with death. With the grave we have made an agreement. When an overwhelming scourge sweeps by, it cannot touch us. For we have made a lie our refuge, and falsehood our hiding place. Now, you, you know what is happening from our earlier study of Isaiah. They were terrified of an enemy. They knew their own weakness. They realized that they weren't sufficient by themselves to defend themselves. And they were afraid of Syria. They were afraid of other nations round about. And they said, now, how are we going to get security? How are we going to be safe? Where will we find salvation? The answer will enter into an alliance with Assyria. And I think that's what Isaiah means when he pictures them saying, we have entered into a covenant with death, with the grave we have made an agreement, because the alliance they had made was one that was surely going to lead them to death. Some other people, I must tell you, think that Isaiah is really talking about these people getting involved in calling up dead spirits, what we call necromancy, that kind of questionable dark area of magic. I don't think that's true myself, but it's, 
it's a possibility, I suppose. I think what he is speaking about is the alliance with Assyria. And what he has been warning them about all the way through the prophecy of Isaiah is putting their trust in the wrong place. Now, isn't that always a grave temptation? When you are aware, as almost every human being who isn't suffering from an excessive degree of megalomania, when every human being discovers the weakness and frailty and limitations of his own flesh, and he is asking, where am I going to find security? What am I going to put my confidence in? And then we have to give an answer to that question. Judah had to give an answer to that question. So did Israel in the north. And the great temptation was to look around for human influences and human powers that would get them out of the threat and put their trust there. That's exactly what they did. And Isaiah says, what you are really boasting about is that you have entered into a covenant with death. You have made an agreement with the grave and put your confidence in a lie and made falsehood your hiding place. Now, um, from verse 17, again, God speaks of the judgment he will bring upon every such false trust and confidence. Verse 17, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Hail will sweep away your refuge, the lie, and water will overflow your hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled. Your agreement with the grave will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge sweeps by, you will be beaten down by it. As often as it comes, it will carry you away morning after morning, day by day, and night by night it will sweep through. What a dreadful message. No wonder Isaiah says the understanding of this message will bring sheer terror. And the terrible thing is, you see, that failure to trust God utterly. Now, I hope we'll learn this lesson if we don't learn any other this evening. Failure to trust God utterly brings its own disappointment, bitter disappointment, and frustration. Now, Isaiah, he, he must have been a fascinating preacher to listen to. He had some amazing illustrations. You notice the illustration in verse 20? He says, failure to trust God brings its own disappointments and its own frustrations. Learn from life, says Isaiah. Have you ever gone into some place, perhaps out into the desert, and you were exhausted at the end of the day, and you saw this bed that was provided? And you said, ah, oh, that's what I need. And you laid yourself down on the bed, and you found that it was too short, and you couldn't stretch out. And you were condemned to a night of discomfort. And then the blanket was not even broad enough to get it round you. And you discovered you were freezing the whole night through. Have you ever been to an SU camp and found that sort of thing happen? Oh, I've been to more sophisticated places than SU camps and found that. And what it must be like if you're the height of Duncan Porter is, is infinitely worse. Look at Isaiah, it says, The bed is too short to stretch out on. The blanket too narrow to wrap around you. And Isaiah is saying, Don't you learn from life? There are things that promise so much when you look at them and they deliver nothing when you lie down on them and put your confidence in them and seek rest from them and from failure to trust in God. There is disappointment and frustration. So Isaiah says, learn from life. Then in verse 21 he says, learn from history. 
The Lord will rise up as he did at Mount Perizim. He will rouse himself as in the valley of Gibeon. This is not the first time God has done this kind of thing. But you will notice that judgment is not his favorite work. Judgment is not what God delights in. He delights in mercy. Judgment, Isaiah says in verse 21, is his strange work, his alien task. What he delights in is what he is speaking about in verse 16. That whereas people make their refuge and hiding place and build their lives on these rotten foundations, he says, see, verse 16, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts will never be dismayed. Now that, of course, is a word for Isaiah's own day, but you will know it's a word that speaks about Christ. And what he is saying is, you rest your confidence in him who is the chief and head cornerstone, and you will never be dismayed. And then in the last verses from verse 23, he says, not only do we need to learn from life and to learn from history, we need to learn from nature. And verse 23 to 29 are really a picture from the agricultural world of Isaiah's day. And he says, pay heed to what I say. And he starts to talk to them about a farmer plowing for planting. Now he says, the judgment of God is like a plow breaking up your fallow ground, like the sharp edge of the plow searing through your life. And God's disciplines are like that. But he said the farmer isn't plowing all his days. He knows that the plowing is for a purpose. It's for a limited time, and it's for a purpose. And all God's disciplines are like that, my dear Christian friends. God's disciplines are not something that he perpetuates for the sake of doing it. He's like the farmer. He has got a purpose in mind. He is actually doing something with a view to producing a harvest and fruit and things that will be beneficial and glorious and beautiful. And he doesn't thresh and thresh and thresh and plow and plow and plow a moment longer than is necessary for his purpose. Samuel Rutherford has got a beautiful phrase when he speaks about God's plowings. He says he purposes a crop. And whenever we are under God's disciplines for whatever reason, he purposes a crop. But the great lesson is that there is nothing in the world so foolish as not to put your trust and confidence in the Lord. That's why the Bible talks about the man who is a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's not always the sinner has said this, but the fool. And there's nothing so foolish as to fail to put your trust in God. And there is nothing so wise as to cast your everything in with him. For his purposes are perfect. His ways are full of grace. And how much we need to learn to trust him. You're listening to Hear the Word of God with the Rev. Eric Alexander, a minister in the Church of Scotland for over 50 years. To access more Bible teaching from Rev. Alexander, visit hearthewordofgod.org, where your generous contribution will help us sustain and grow this ministry. That's hearthewordofgod.org. 
You could choose instead to mail a check to this address, 600 Eden Road, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 17601, or call 1-800-488-1888. This program is a presentation of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. I'm Mark Daniels. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next time for Eric Alexander and Hear the Word of God.